Hello everybody, I'm Professor Crimsy and once again I have been summoned to offer you yet another Clip Studio Paint tutorial. In today's class I will teach you 10 tips and tricks to improve your speed and efficiency when coloring manga pages and for this special occasion I sketched and lined a manga page of my own so I can demonstrate all the tips I want to show you. This video will be split in two parts. In the first part, we'll go over a few tips and Clip Studio Paint features that will make your coloring process faster before you get to coloring itself. And in the second part, we'll cover coloring tips themselves, such as how to efficiently create flat colors, shading, backgrounds, and special effects in your manga. So without further ado, let's begin the ritual. This is an easy one, but if you're going to be drawing a character over and over hundreds of times, a good thing to have nearby is a reference sheet of the set character, or at the very least, a colored illustration that you can use as a general reference. Of course, you could open your images in different project windows and go back and forth between projects to pick colors or add them as an extra layer in your current project and do the same thing, but doing this gets tedious really fast. So the best way to proceed is to add your riff sheets to your subview window. To be able to view your subview window, you may have to head over to the window menu and activate subview. In this window, you can click on the folder icon, select as many images as you desire and use the arrows to navigate between your references. The next best thing about this window is if you click on this color picker icon, your mouse will automatically turn into the color picker tool whenever you go back to the window area, which makes picking colors super fast. With your ref sheets close by, now is the time to save even more time. And a great way to save time is to create color sets for each of your main and side recurring characters. A color set is essentially a catalog of color swatches used to quickly color your character without having to pick from a reference every time you need to color a specific character. To create a color set, simply head over to the submenu where the color wheel is, click on the color set menu, this will display a bunch of random color. Click on edit color set, then add new settings. Rename it using your chosen character's name, mine will be called Gabby, press enter and finally press OK. Now all you'll get is this blank slate of color swatches. But first, let's make this easier on us by displaying colors in a way that will make it easy to remember which is what. Simply click on the menu bar icon, go to view and choose either list small or list medium. This will display your color but also allow you to name each of them in relation to what they're referring to. The color sets are especially efficient when used along with the subview window we set up earlier. All you need to do is go to your subview window, color pick something, go back to your color set, click on add color and give it a name. Do this for each of your characters and I promise you it will save you a lot of time in the long run. This might be a bit obvious to some, but not everybody knows about hotkeys and how to set them up. You can access your hotkeys menu by going to File, then Shortcut Settings. A new window will open and by default it should show you the tool shortcuts. You should try to memorize the keys attached to the tools you use the most, such as P for the pen tool, E for the eraser, B for brushes, G for bucket tool, Ctrl T for transformations, etc. But should you require the use of a specific tool or action that is not already attached to a key yet, know that you can always set up your own add key. For instance, I could go to Crimsy's homemade brushes, which we created in this previous tutorial, click on the evil thorns brush, then edit shortcut, and press Q, then enter, and now every time I'll press the letter Q, my brush will be selected. This can be used on any tools or any feature within Clip Studio Paint, even auto action, which in turn can kickstart a whole series of predetermined quick actions, but I digress. Last but not least, another great way to save time is to learn how to plan ahead and keep your project organized. This is as easy as renaming your folders and layers accordingly and making sure everything is separated into its own folders such as your sketch, your line art and your different coloring stages. I know it's tempting to work quickly and not rename layers, but having to toggle layers on and off to see which is what wastes a lot of time. Another great tip to improve your overall organization is to get used to color coding your folders, which is really easy to do. Simply click on folder, go to change palette color and choose the color you want. A good tip is to always use the same color for the same types of folders so your brain eventually will get used to it to the point of not even needing to read folder names anymore. Feel free to also select a custom color if you'd like. For example here, I'm using black as the color for the general page folder. Once we're done with the setup of our project, sketch and line art, we can finally get to coloring our manga page. Typically, the steps to coloring a page would be laying down flat colors, adding shading, then highlights, then working on the background and adding special effects at the very end. 
So let's start with flat colors. I've often seen people, including my past self, fill in colors by hand using a brush and this is such a huge waste of time. There are so much better ways of going through the process of doing flat colors and the best method of all is by far learning about the bucket tool and its features. So let's see what they are. There's the refer only to editing layer option, which is pretty self-explanatory. It means that the only layer the bucket tool considers when filling in something is the one you're currently working on and that's it. But the refer to the other layer option is where things get truly interesting. The apply to connected pixels should typically remain active, but if you deactivate it, you can then pick any color and change your entire layer to that color in one single click. The close cap option though is very important. This allows you to control the sensitivity of your bucket fill when it comes to dealing with gaps in your line art. As you can see here, the lower the sensitivity, the more gaps the bucket will ignore, but the higher it gets, the more it will stop the color from spilling over the gaps. Higher values can be quite useful if your line art style is more loose, but if your line art is very clean, a lower value will fill in your area more thoroughly. Next, there is the color margin option, which globally affects the amount of similar colored pixels that will be cut by the bucket in one fill. A low value such as 5 will result in more white unfilled spots in your area, especially near narrow spaces where lines intersect. A higher value such as 80 will catch most of these spaces and fill them in, which is preferable, but make sure not to put the value too high or you might end up filling in parts of the line art that you do not want to fill in. The area scaling option is also pretty important since it serves as bleed between your flat colors and your line art. For instance, if you put it at zero, the filled pixels will cover exactly the area up to the line art, which is not exactly great in most cases. If you give it a value of, let's say, one, and use the round scaling mode, your fill area will slightly bleed over your line art. Giving it a higher value might cause your flat colors to spill over your line art though, so be mindful of that and experiment with what looks best for you. I personally found that keeping mine at a value of 5 with the scaling mode to darkest pixel gave me the best result. I'll go over the other options quickly, but basically, refer multiple determines which layer the bucket tool will consider when filling in colors. So you can either choose all of them or only a reference layer, but you can also just choose to exclude layers like text or locked layers. Fill up to vector path is something you can use to fill in specific vector lines. And as for opacity and anti-aliasing, I think it's just best to leave those at default value all the time, so I don't really touch those. Now that we went over the bucket tool features and figured out which settings works best for your project, it's finally time to fill in those flat colors. When doing this, remember that you can always go with a darker temporary color so you don't miss white spots in your line art. But wait, there is one very last useful feature that the bucket tool has, which I believe is unique to Clip Studio Paint, and it's that you're not required to click every single area you want to fill in. You can simply drag your bucket tool over multiple areas at once and they will all fill in automatically. Just out how cool is that? Now that our flat colors are done, let's get into the shading of our page. The first thing you should do before starting to shade your page is to pick your lighting scenario and quickly draft your background to set the mood of your page. Is it daytime? Is it nighttime? Is the sun setting? Is your light natural or artificial? And most of all, what angle does it come from? In this case, I drew some flames behind my character and went with a simple night sky because I want the main source of lighting to be the purple flames around my character. It's important to figure out these details before committing to shading because this type of information is what will drive your entire shading process. With our light source in mind, now is the time to start shading our scene and characters. Typically, you would want to apply shading before working on highlights, but as a general tip, I found that when coloring a dark scene, like the one we're working on now, it's sometimes better to actually start with highlights before getting to the shading, because it helps setting up the mood of the panel right away. The first feature you'll need to learn when starting this process is the clipping layer feature. Clipping layers mean you create a layer right above your flat color layer and click on the clip to layer below icon. Now, when you'll draw on this new layer, your pen strokes will always be limited to the pixel pixels present in the layer below. Clipped layers can also be stacked on top of each other, so the best thing to do is to create a new clipped layer every time you want to add something to your flat color layer, such as shading, highlights, soft shadows, glow, textures, anything. You can even clip a folder or layer to another folder if you want your layer to affect the entirety of the layers within that folder. 
The layer blending modes features is probably the second most important one to learn when creating shadows and highlights. This feature allows you to change how colors are interpreted by your layer when stacked above another layer. For example, putting your layer on multiply will take the dark values of your layer and add them to the layer below, which is perfect for creating shadows that will adapt on any color they are laid on. The screen mode is my personal favorite for creating highlights because it does the exact opposite and only combines the lighter values of your layer to the one below it. Other good blending modes are Add Glow for, well, adding glow, Soft Light for adding textures, and Overlay for adding accents of colors with a soft brush. But my best advice regarding blending modes would be to try each and every one of them and see what results they give you, so you can use them to the best of their potential later on in your art projects. Lastly, the third feature that is essential to learn when shading digital art is the Preserve Opacity feature. Preserving opacity means that the pixels within your layer will not be able to gain or lose opacity when painted over. To do this, simply select your layer and click the Lock Transparent Pixels icon. This is a feature that makes it incredibly fast to change the layer's colors, which is something you'll find yourself doing a lot when coloring pretty much anything. As you can see here, I started by creating my highlights using the same purple as the flame behind my character, but using the blending mode Add Glow. Once the highlights were done, I started adding some soft shadows using the soft brush on Multiply. So next, what I did is create a new layer on Multiply, picked a dark and light purple color, and with the gradient tool, I created another shadow layer to make the lighting a bit more dramatic and help my character blend better in the scene. I lowered the opacity of the layer a bit to make the shadows look softer, and that's it. As a last optional step, I went back to my main character's hair and added further shadows to give it more volume, but giving further shading passes to a manga is not something I would recommend doing all the time, since it just means it's more time consuming, but sometimes it can help if used sparingly. Special effects is something that can definitely add a punch to a manga page. This includes effects like particles, glow, bloom, and noise, among many others. Particle effects are best made through the use of the airbrush tool, but know that you can also download a ton of unique special effects brushes by going to the Clip Studio Asset Store. A lot of these resources are free, so definitely go check them out if you haven't yet. By the way, all the downloaded assets will be kept right here in your download folder and all you need to do to use them is drag and drop them in a folder of your choice. I would even say it's easy to create your very own brushes if you want to. That's something we also covered in a previous clip to do paint tutorial, by the way. Glow really adds this extra punch of color in the scene. Near the end, I even added a bit of glow as a new layer on top of all the folders so I could create this nice effect that makes the character interact with the lighting more. Another type of glow effect that sometimes brings a really nice soft feeling to your art is called Bloom. Bloom is done by basically taking your entire page folder, duplicating it, and merging all the files into one image. Then all you need to do is go to the filter menu, blur, Gaussian blur, and input a low or high value depending on how strong you want the effect to be. Then simply put your layer on the blending mode screen, lower its opacity, and voila! Now everything looks a bit lighter and softer. Lastly, to give a more retro graphic novel feel to your page, you can also add a bit of noise texture to it. To do this, head to the filter menu, click on render, and then pearl in noise. Play with the settings a bit, and once you're happy with the noise density, press OK. Then put your layer on the blending mode soft light and reduce its opacity a bit. I personally really like adding texture to my manga, but of course this is purely a matter of taste and is by all means optional. In the very last stage of your manga page creation, never shy away from using correction layers to perfect the look and overall mood of your panels. Correction layers are special layers that can influence coloring aspects like values, contrast, hue and saturation, color balance, and much more. When I was done with my page, I was feeling like everything was a bit too dark, so I went to layer, correction layer, and created a new level correction layer and brightness layer. I played around with them a bit and used them to lighten the overall page. Then I felt like my night scene lacked a bit of blue, so I went back to layer, correction layer, and this time I chose to create a new color balance layer and play with the blue values until I was happy with it. I generally use these three the most, but the use saturation layer is also extremely useful for managing how saturated your colors are and changing the hue of a color if you feel like it's not quite right, but that's correction layers in a nutshell. 
At the end of the day, I think the tip that will save you the most time is keep things simple and manageable. Comics and manga are this strange middle ground between illustrations, novels, and animation. They can often be lengthy stories featuring polished artwork, but also require you to draw the same characters and environments over and over from different angles. So really, if there's one last tip I can offer you is that while designing your characters, choosing your color palettes, and defining your overall coloring style, always keep in mind what your end goal is, how many pages you'll need to produce in total, how much time you can allow yourself to spend on each page, and how you can simplify what you got to make the entire process faster. A good thing you can do is simply make one single page and time yourself. Then use that time to scope your entire project. If you realize the amount of time necessary is ridiculous and it will take you forever to complete it, then simplify your methods. It can be as easy as removing some accessories on your character, limiting yourself to three or four colors per character, not adding line weight to your line art, or removing extra passes of shadows and highlights. Any extra step you can remove that does not greatly affect the final product is something that will save you an incredible amount of time, trust me. So these were the best 10 tips I know to help you become faster and more efficient at coloring your manga pages. I really hope this video helped you in some ways, and if it did, please consider liking and subscribing, this really helps the channel, and your support keeps me motivated to make even more tutorials in the future. I know it's been a minute since my previous videos, but I plan on coming back for real and <laughs> give you more sweet content soon. But for now, that will be it for me, time to crawl back into my crypt and dream about layer blending modes. That's all I can see now when I close my eyes. Alright, bye! <laughs>